Heavenly Father, I thank you again for another opportunity to preach your word. Pray, O oh Lord, that you help me as I preach. And um, let me speak things of the Spirit and not of myself, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3. It's a loaded one here. Um, but my anchor verse is verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. The Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. The title of my sermon this evening is Having the Mind of Christ. Having the Mind of Christ. And yes, we should have one mind, but whose mind? That is a question, right? Whose mind? Open to Philippians chapter 2. Should we have the pastor's mind? That is leading or leaning towards cult, right? <laughs> if you have a man's mind, everything I say, that's what we are supposed to do. So everyone just follow my mind, my own thinking. That is wrong. That's not what God says. When he says having um, one mind, he's not saying have the mind of the pastor or have a man's mind or what men think. But he's talking about having the mind of Christ. And how do we get the mind of Christ? By following the word of God. Because God has revealed himself to us by his word. So God commands that we have the mind of Christ. First, uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 the Bible says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strive of vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So, Paul is going further to explain this. I know, yeah, Peter said it, Paul said it, it said in very of the letters that was, that was written in the New Testament, the epistles of the apostles. Verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So he's not saying, oh, forget your own things, but just look on the things of others. Hey, <laughs> he says, look also on the things of others. Let his mind be in you. So which mind is supposed to be in you? Which, what is that one mind? What is that like mind uh, that we should have? It is the mind of Christ. It says, let this mind be in you, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God had highly exalted him and had given him a name which is above every name that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father have you noticed that the mind that God is telling us to have and he's saying the mind that, is, that was in Christ, it's talking about a mind of suffering, a mind of suffering for doing good, a mind that's ready to do good no matter the cost. So suffering as a Christian, because yea, they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So that is the mind we're supposed to have. And guess what? We have the mind of Christ. That's why he says, let this mind be in you. Allow it. You have the mind of Christ. So allow it to be in you. That's what the Bible is trying to say. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, the Bible says, For who had known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. You have it. So let it, let that mind. That's the mind that we should all be in. Let us have that mind think like that. Because the battle happens in the mind. You know, you choose, you decide what is going to be in your heart or what you're going to be made of. So, and God has given us what? The power, uh, the spirit of a sound mind. Amen. All right, let's get to our text, uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. It's a long one, so follow me. It says in verse 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may, they also may be... Jeez. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So... It says, to the wise, be subjection to your own husbands. It's not that all married women are subject, subject to men. And worse, it's not that all women are subjected to men. It's married women be, subject, be in subjection to your own husband. You know, this passage has been used as an example for wives to save their unbelieving husbands. So, and I believe that is not the main application. I don't even believe it's the application here. But I'll, I'll say that that's not the main application here. The main application is different. Because 
uh, uh, here is for a believing husband that is not obeying the word of God. So the wife should use her conversation to you know, help the man, to make the man, uh, her husband, to change. Because it's impossible for a soul to be won by conversation only. I thought that's what we do in soul winning. Okay, by conversation, <laughs> I mean your way of life. And that's what it means here in the context. When it says conversation, it's talking about your way of life, your manner of living. So it's, it's an older word here. So your way of life is not, it does not, it's not supposed to save somebody. In fact, cannot save someone. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So it is by preaching, preaching the word, speaking, saying the words of God, because we are saved by the incorruptible seed of, of uh, the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. So uh, this could be a stumbling block for believers, or uh, yeah, believers mainly. I don't want to go so away and say, oh yeah, just the conversation of my life. Like how I live my life, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Where in that place did he say that your light will so shine and that is the gospel? Right? So you have to preach, right? If your light is shining and people are going to be saved, you have to give them the word of God. So uh, it's not for a wife that has a believer, a believing wife that has an unbelieving husband, that oh, just by your conversation, the guy is going to get saved. It doesn't even say that in the passage. <laughs> it doesn't say that he will be saved. So don't use this to marry an unbeliever and say, oh, you know what, I'll just be a good woman and my husband will be saved. <laughs> don't, don't fall for that. So chase conversation is a good starting point, right? Do you chase conversation, and if your husband is not saved, a good starting point is chase conversation, but you still have to give the gospel. Chase means pure, moderate, not excessive. So the way, your, the way of your life, you know, moderation, not an excessive, don't dive into excessive things, you know, purity. All right, and the Bible says coupled with fear. So it's not that you fear your husband. It's not just conversation and you fear your husband. It's but that you fear God. Yes, your husband is not obeying the word of God, but your conversation coupled with fear because God does not tell you to fear a man. The only godly fear is the fear of God. So if you fear God, you will submit to your husband, which is exactly what God commands because the Bible says wife should be in subjection to the husband. And this is why uh, you should disobey your husband if he's asking you to do what God God tells you not to do. So if your husband is leading you to sin, because you fear God, you disobey your husband. For example, your husband tells you, never pray, never read your Bible, never, <laughs> you know. You're going to have to disobey your husband because you'd rather obey a God than man. That's what the Bible says. So because you're fearing God, your conversation, but with the fear of the Lord. Understand the, uh, the higher powers there. Uh, let's move on. Verse 3. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold, of, of putting on an, of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So the plating of hair, right? The plating of hair. Say, but your daughter, Pastor, your daughter has yeah, her hair plated. All right. This does not mean plating hair is sinful, right? You're adorning. Oh, let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of hair. It doesn't mean that it's sinful. It means plating hair should not be the focus of your life. That's just what it means. It's like, oh, I can't, I can't leave the house without my hair done. You know, when I was in college, there were some people that I never saw without makeup period. Like, I don't care what time the class was. If it was 5 a.m. There was no class at 5 a.m. But they are with makeup. I mean, <laughs> it was amazing. So that is the focus of their life. They, you, do you know there was someone I saw one time mistakenly and I was like, wait, you wear glasses? And you, you, this how you look? I was so shocked. They said, that's not your hair? <laughs> Like, I was so shocked. So there's some people that can't leave without their wigs on or something down their hair or their makeup or something like that. That is the focus of their life. They will even be late coming to church just because, you know, <laughs> I have get my hair done. So God is saying that should not be your focus. Your outward adorning should not be the focus. It, it has a place, but it is not what makes you the prize far above rubies. Remember, the virtuous woman is a woman that has her prize far above rubies, as the Bible says. Now, if it is in the sight of God of a great price, in the sight of God is great price, what if in sight of men? 
priceless. So if you want to be priceless as a woman, as a wife, right? We're still talking about a wife, we chase conversation and all of that. If you want to be as a wife, that should not be your focus. Oh, how I look, my outward appearance. It should be the inward man, inner man. In fact, most women in Africa of African heritage need to plate their hair. So you can't just say, oh, plating hair is wrong. They need to plate their hair to help to maintain it. I didn't go, I didn't go over this with my wife, so I might be wrong in some places, but I have three other sisters, so that helped me out. Um, they need to plate their hair to help maintain it, to keep it clean, to make sure, I'm sorry, I'm reading the lines here, sorry. <laughs> To make sure it doesn't get matted up, you know, or you can't comb it. So to make sure you can comb it. And to keep it healthy, right, that's keeping it clean. And if not, it will begin to fall off. Like you see hair on the comb. Because if you don't maintain your hair, if you don't plate it to keep it right, I mean, if, if you don't plate it, then put it this way, you spend more time on your hair every morning, right? Um, okay, all right. So you spend more time on your hair every morning, then it's becoming the focus. <laughs> exactly what God says should not be the focus. It's becoming the focus because all oh, my hair is all messed up. When you plate it, then you don't have to worry. You don't have to spend too much time on your hair while you're keeping your hair healthy. Now, other women that have straight hair or relaxed hair or, you know, from other cultures, might not take as much time to maintain their hair. They might, you know, just oh, just leave their hair and walk out of the house, and that's fine. If God is just saying, don't spend, that's not your focus, your outward appearance. But it doesn't mean you should not keep yourself healthy because your your body is the temple of the Lord. So don't just look at plating of the hair and say, oh yeah, you should not plate your hair. That means you should not wear what are the things enlisted. That means you should not wear gold. Once you wear gold, you've saved. Anybody wearing gold hair, come for lemps your hand. God bless that hand. But, see. It doesn't mean it's a sin. <laughs> Amen? No, there's some people that don't need to play their hair. Right? As I said, the straight hair, if you're spending your time plating your hair and all of that, I mean, you don't need to. <laughs> you can just be normal. But the people that need to just to make life easier, then go ahead. Or put it on of apparel. <laughs> so that just, plating of hair just goes with the rest of them. Right? All right, so where was I? Now the hidden man. It says, let it be the hidden man of the heart. I, I think we're talking about women here. So are all women men at heart? <laughs> right? Now that's what the homosexual agenda will teach you. The sodomy agenda. Oh yeah, you see, a you know, woman can be a man and all of that. That's not what the Bible is teaching here. The Bible says there's neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ. Because it's talking about he that is born of God. In fact, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, the Bible says, For in resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So in heaven there's no male or female married. Or, so... We're all one in, in Christ. So that's what God is talking about. He that is born of God, the hidden man, right? The inner man. Okay, so why didn't God just call it the inner woman? I mean, if it's a woman, inner woman is a man, inner man. I mean, if it's just no male or female, then just inner woman. Because we are born of God. That is what is born of God. And guess what? God is male. When it's a born of God, in fact, it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God cannot, sorry, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. So this is not you anymore. This is the spirit born of God that is in you. It's the in, no, it's not you. I mean, it's not your flesh. It's the inner man in you that is born of God. It's of God, not of this world. And God is masculine. Man is created in the image of God, right? An image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them, right? So man is created in the image of God, and therefore God is masculine, he's male. Don't believe in all this Shekinah glory, God is male and female, that's all Jewish Bible, right? So God is male, and therefore it is the hidden man. Every time God appears, it's like man, right? So he's the hidden man. So just, you know, get used to it as women. All right, number five, at verse five. For after this manner, in the old time, the old women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters are ye, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So, why should women obey their husbands? Why should women be subjection be in subjection to their husband? Oh, because of culture. Because you know, in the old days, you know, women did not know their rights. So thank God for feminist movement. And now women are more powerful than men. We've proved that. That's not because of culture. 
It says that's what has been from the beginning. It is the tradition. It's what God ordained. It has been passed down. It's the old path where the good way is. As, as the Bible says, that is how it has been from the beginning. Right? Sarah called Abraham Lord in her heart. It's not about what she wore or how her hair was. The hidden man of the heart. It's inside that makes you great. It's inside that makes you priceless. So in her heart, she called him Lord. So it's not lip service or rather eye service for uh, like some cultures I know it's eye service or lip service when they're calling people Lord or Father for example the Yoruba culture I'm just listening to cultures I know the Yoruba culture call everybody that's older Father right all the old men Father Baba I don't know what it calls but everyone is Father now do they treat those people like their fathers oh so it's lip, it's lip service it's just saying it with your mouth but not with your heart and that's not what God wants. God wants us to be sincere. Let our yes be yes, our no be no. So you don't call somebody something, but in your heart, you don't. If the person is not that thing. You see what I mean? So, and not just your right. Okay, Igbos. Everybody that's older than you is either your uncle or your auntie. <laughs> right? Oh, this auntie, this uncle, this. You know. So, oh, so it's lip service, and God doesn't want that. Amen? So, Sarah was calling Abraham Lord. She actually meant it. She was saying it in her heart, not just giving lip service. All right. Well, when I say she was saying in her heart, if you go back to the reference, I don't have time because I want to cover this whole chapter. If you go back to the reference, the only time Abraham called, I say Abraham, Sarah called Abraham Lord, she said it in her heart, said, and how will my Lord, speaking to herself. So in her heart, she was calling him Lord. And imagine what she would call him outside, right? Out of the mouth. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Uh, it says, whose daughters are, uh, ye are as long as... So wait, so if you don't do these things, does it mean you're no more the daughter of, of, um, of uh, Sarah? Does it mean that you're no more saved? Because quickly you want to talk about, oh, people, this is how you lose your salvation. <laughs> oh yeah, you see, if you don't do this, then you're no more saved because you're not a daughter of, uh, of Sarah, uh, of the old women, uh, time passed. Uh, it doesn't mean that. It's saying it means you're not a product of her faith and submission to her husband. They're still saved, but you cannot say, oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm learning from this. Uh, you're not following the traditions that was passed down. You're not a child of that. You're not a product of that. But you are saved. So, uh, uh, I think that's the point I want to make. Alright, number seven, verse seven. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So the Bible says the husbands also to dwell with the wives according to knowledge. That is loaded right there. To dwell with a, uh, your wife according to knowledge. Because if you don't have knowledge <laughs> to dwell with her, you will not be able to dwell with her. You will, because you have to have knowledge to lead your wife, right? So, and this is why a boy can be a father, but it takes a man to be a husband. You know, a boy can father a child. Yeah, it's very easy. But it takes a man to actually be a husband. And I'm not talking about a boyfriend. I'm talking about a husband. Those are two different things. A boyfriend knows he can just up and leave at any time. <laughs> no commitment. So, yeah, she's, she's crazy. I, I'm out of here. Right? But a husband is like, you know, uh, I got to stick through this. <laughs> yeah, it takes knowledge. You have to be a man. But that's why you don't hear, oh, he's my man friend. He's still your boyfriend. Say boy. <laughs> Let him be a man. Step up. Bring the ring. You know what I mean? <laughs> then you can say man friend. Hey, no, yeah, this is my man. This is my husband. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, let's move on. Let me not dive to spend so much time on that. Uh, and don't be like the man going their own way. That's what the Bible is saying. You know, have knowledge and deal with her and stay with her. But when you don't want to have knowledge, then you ruin your life. Oh, men going their own way, the meat house, they don't want to get married. That's not what God has called us to be. Men running away because they have no knowledge. And if you have knowledge of what women want, you're a blessed man. If you have knowledge and a woman is calling you Lord, oh wow, I mean, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> Because when you know what women want, you are blessed. It's it, because they don't want much. It's not gold and money and stuff that women want. Come to me, my office. I'll tell. I'm just scared. <laughs> uh, the Bible tells us what they want, right? So just do what God tells you to do. Love them as Christ loved the church. That's what they want. Amen. 
Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, the Bible says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good plan, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So you find it, don't, don't run away from getting married, but say, yeah, when I find a wife, I'm getting favor from the Lord. Right. Is, this is God blessing you. Obviously, doing it according to what God requires, you know, someone that's saved, not so that you're not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. All right, on and on. Uh, it says, giving honor as the weaker vessel, as the weaker vessel. So even science proves this to be a fact that women are weaker than men. I mean, examples, in war, men go to war. He said, by now there are women going to war. It's funny, for the Navy SEALs, this is what I've heard anyway, for the Marines and stuff, for the women to join the Marine, they had to reduce the, the test. <laughs> Because a woman cannot pass the man's test, so they have to reduce the qualification for a woman to be a marine. So the fact is, men are stronger. Men are the stronger vessel. Vessel. Remember, it's the same hidden man that a woman has that a man has. There's no difference between male or female, right? But the vessel that that hidden man is living in, the man happens to have the stronger vessel because of the role God wants us to play. You know, play your role. See, your dishwasher and your washing machine, one is not superior to another. Dishwasher has a role, and washing machine has a role. You don't put clothes into the dishwasher. Then you go like, this dishwasher is useless. But it's not to wash clothes. But that's what's happening now. Women want to play the role men are supposed to play, and men, trust me, are playing the role women are supposed to play. Right? And then, then it's like putting clothes in the dishwasher. You know, what do you expect? All right, the world is just going crazy. So, women are the weaker vessel, as God says, and you have to do give them honor according as weaker vessels. So, even as children, my daughter is the first, my son is the second, and my son is stronger than my daughter right now. And you can't look at it and be, oh, but she's older. No, man are the stronger vessel. She, he can fall down the steps and get up, and I'll be looking at the steps. Man, he destroyed it. <laughs> but my daughter falls down the steps. Oh no. Whew. Uh, okay, so that hasn't happened, I'm just saying. <laughs> but as I said, it's a fact, but if you are abiding, then you choose truth over facts. <laughs> you choose truth over facts. What, what do you mean that that's a fact? And what is the truth? The truth is what the Bible says, that it's still the same thing as a fact. <laughs> anyway, that was just a joke. All right. So, it doesn't mean we should take advantage or lord it over them. Don't lord it over them or take advantage over them because they had a weaker vessel. The Bible says, give honor. It says to honor them. Feminism, as we know it now, in this world going on, feminism is the opposite extreme to Islam in this regard. Because Islam, they are lording it over the women. I mean, the women cannot drive. The women cannot, I mean, just list the things the women can do. They can't even go to a ball game as the men are going to. What are, there are so many, think how they're suppressing women. That's not what God called us to do. I mean, they can't even show their faces. <laughs> Right? So only their eyes and stuff, depending on, I guess, their age or something. But they don't show that they have to wear this hijab and stuff like that. Now, feminism is all the other, swung all the other way to the right. So where no, the women now rule over the men. Like, oh, my, my vice president has to be a woman because she's better than all the men, of course. I mean, if there's a qualified man that can do the job, no, it has to be a woman. And not just a woman, it has to be a woman of color. Because all the other, or whites, I should say, or whites, I don't care if you're very smart and everything, a woman of color is better than you. So, okay, that's, that's what the world is, feminism. Like, women, everything. Women can do what men can do. So feminism is one extreme, Islam and the like on the other extreme. God is saying moderate, right? Know your role, play your role, and husbands give honor to your wives. So what is that honor? To labor and provide for them, to protect and be ready to lay down your life. Remember, as Christ loved the church, to lead, to guide, to comfort. You're supposed to be a covering to her, amen? Because this actually affects your prayers. That's what the Bible says. It's because you have, your prayers will be hindered. 
You know, the saying that goes, a happy wife is a happy life. All right? If you're not sure, ask Elkanah. All right, let's move on. Verse 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. So this is where I got the anchor verse. verse um, having the mind of Christ says, Be ye all of one mind. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. You know, how you going to speak the same thing? Uh, maybe if you have one mind, then you're speaking the same thing. You all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that there be perfect, sorry, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Why am I bringing this up? Because when he says, be of one mind, he's saying, you guys should think the same, act the same, have the same purpose, the same drive, one accord, and your judgment, your core beliefs should be the same. And it's not just in church, it should be in your family. I mean, if your family, if the husband is thinking one way, and the wife is thinking one way, then the wife is not help meet for the husband. It's not supporting the husband. You, got, you should have one mind. See, if you're running a business, you want to get all your, work, your employees to be of one mind. What is the goal? To make profit. <laughs> Right? That's the, that's the soul winning goal right there, right? Make profit. Then every other thing, how do we make profit and maximize it? Understand, that's why you're working. If you think it's something else. Unless you're working in non-profit, obviously. Um, if you're in a sports team, what's the goal? To score that goal, right? So how are we going to get it done? You guys stay back and defend, right? You guys control the ball, and you guys make sure you score. Everyone has a job. But when the person that scores is looked at as the best player, then, you know, how about the guys that are defending? The, the world best player known, Messi, he was there in the team when they scored eight upon them. It's not his job to defend, right? Anyway, uh, where was I? So, we should have the same core beliefs, and that's why in this church, we have the same core beliefs. What do we believe in? It's there on our website. The right gospel. What is the right gospel? Saved by grace through faith, not of works. Amen? Because you cannot mix grace and works. That's what the Bible says. What I know I call believe, the right Bible, KJV, King James only. That's why we use the right Bible, so that all our doctrines will align. Imagine this one reading NIV, this one reading KJV, and we're saying two different, in fact, we're reading Acts chapter 8, we get to 36, and I keep reading 37, and you're like, oh, where's 37? <laughs> if you're on NIV. You see, you, we have to have the same Bible, because saying the same thing. It's only the Bible that has different versions and they still call it the same Bible. It, it should be different names. It should be different books. But KJV in English, obviously, if you're in another language, then you find the Texas Receptus interpreted Bible for your language. All right, so we can have the same doctrines, such as soul winning, the Great Commission, how we do soul winning, why we do soul winning, doctrines against sodomy, doctrines against dispensationalism, doctrines against Calvinism, doctrines like, uh, showing that we're the priesthood of the believer, and there's so much more. So much more. We have the same beliefs, so that we can say the same things. So one person is not here saying, oh, let's let all the sodomites in. And that person is like, oh, but no, let's not let the sodomites in. And we're not saying the same things. But God say, have one mind. One mind. He's all but that's your mind, Pastor. No, that's what the Bible says. It's the mind of Christ. So now some areas we might not agree, right? Because the Bible leaves it open for interpretation. Who are the two witnesses, for example, in Revelation? Is it Moses and Elijah, or is it Enoch and Elijah? Or Holy Communion. How do we do the Holy Communion? People might differ. Doesn't mean that oh, one is seen and the other isn't. It's just, you know, everyone will be persuaded. So those are some examples where we can differ. But the core beliefs should be, we should have this one mind on that. Amen? So another is, uh, important aspect is following the leadership of the church. When it says, have one mind, is to follow the leadership of this church. Especially in things like, okay, the Holy Communion. So if the pastor decides, oh, this is how we're doing the Holy Communion, uh, that's how you have to do the Holy Communion. Unless you can prove that he's wrong from the Bible. So you have that one mind in it. You can say, oh, no, I know he does Holy Communion this way, but I think we should eat 
uh, sorry, we should drink the blood first, like drink the wine first, not eat the bread. Let's drink the wine, then pray, then eat the bread while we're eating two of them at the same time. You, know, you can have your own way, but if pastor says this way we are doing it, and that's where we are doing it because we should all be of one accord, one mind. If you say, oh, no, but I don't believe it's uh, Moses and Elijah, I believe it's Enoch and Elijah. It doesn't mean you should go and tell the people in the church, I don't believe pastor is right. In this one, I actually think, no, you keep your mouth shut because pastor said it's Moses and Elijah. Prove that it is wrong. Oh, then I want to be my own pastor. Fine! Then go be your own pastor. It's, 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 it's no problem, right? So if you don't want to be your own pastor, then you stay and keep your mouth shut and follow the pastor unless you prove him wrong from the Bible and say, okay, this is wrong according to the Bible. Then we we'll have one mind. We follow what the Bible says. Amen? And you say, okay, I'm just living this church. You go to another church, the pastor will disagree with you. See, everybody's not the same. <laughs> so you just keep hopping and hopping and you never settle down. Uh, then, then is a problem about you, not necessarily the word, uh, not necessarily the churches. It's about you. Uh, okay, so as I said, it's important, it's, um, another important aspect is following the leadership of the church. The bishop or the overseer or the ruler, as the Bible calls it, is the is a pastor. You have to follow him. Is the under shepherd, Jesus being the head and the chief shepherd, is just like a parent giving one of the children charge over the other children. Now, if the other children disobey what that ch uh, child is given charge over. Who is that child disobeying? The parent. Simple as that. So that's how you have to look at it. So as long as you're not being led into sin, then we have to be in one accord. Say the same things, the same purpose, as long as not being, that's what Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And even if it's not your preference, for example, if you prefer to start the service one hour earlier, too bad. I mean, the service starts when the service starts. <laughs> so if you prefer ice cream instead of yogurt at the end of service, too bad. It's yogurt that we got. You can't say, ah, oh, it's just yogurt. I wanted ice cream. Ice cream is better. You know, just be one accord. Don't have envy, strive, and you know, all of that. And you say, oh, but pastor, you get your way. Every time is your way. Hey, what if there's some things I have to sacrifice to? I prefer to start Wednesday services by six, not seven, so I can go home earlier. <laughs> but I know people are coming from far. I know people have to go to work, and some people are coming from far, so I have to give them time. They're settled so they can get their family and come to church. If not, everyone's just rushing from, from home and not picking up their children or their family. So, or rushing from um, work, I mean. So, there are things you have to sacrifice. Everyone sacrifices for the good of all of us. So, you don't like ice cream, then manage uh, the yogurt. Amen? Bring your own honey and mix it. You know what <laughs> I know there are some yogurts that are not sweetened. Uh, all right, let's move on. So render good for evil, because it says don't render evil for evil, or railing for railing. Render good for evil. Open to Romans chapter 12. I'll just read this passage to help explain it, and we'll move on. Romans chapter 12. Bible says in verse 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and not curse. Sorry, and bless and curse not, sorry. Verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So somebody celebrating in church, celebrate with the person, rejoice with the person. Someone is mourning, weep with the person, amen? Don't, oh, I only come for rejoicing or I only come for weeping or you're happy when someone, or you're unhappy when someone's rejoicing and you're happy when someone's weeping. No. That is not having one mind. That's not being in one accord. Amen. Be of the same mind toward one another. Mind not high things, but con condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. Verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as light in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. Now, this is talking about unbelievers, not saying because the wrath of God is not coming on the saints, unbelievers. We're not pointed to wrath. Because he says, live peaceably with all men. Then he's saying, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. It's talking about all men now, not just the believers. Verse 20. If, uh, sorry, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen? All right, verse 10. Back to 1 Peter chapter 3. 
for, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Ensue it means to make it happen. All right, so if you love life, you see good days, refrain your tongue from evil and your lips that they speak no guile. So refrain your tongue from giving harm, from harming people by what you say, maybe false witnessing or lying. And speaking no guile means no deception. Guile means deception. No, so no deception should come out of your mouth. I mean, it's pretty much saying the same thing because you're deceiving somebody. And if uh, your tongue is your, your tongue is refrained from evil, and your lips are speaking no guile, it's talking about your heart. That means your heart should not be a heart of deception because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. So God is talking about your heart. Your heart should be in a, uh, should be pure not an evil heart or a heart full of deception and this whole world is full of deception in fact when you overcome the world you're saved and the deception on the world is what you're saved from the devil all he does is deception that's why in the millennial reign the devil will be uh, being changed literally for a thousand years and there'll be no more deception that's what the bible says <laughs> no deception <laughs> because the truth will prevail all right, it's true evil. I'll take you to Job 1.1. One, one. You have to open there. But Job 1.1, one, one, the Bible says, There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. So that's what it means. You, you get your life right with the Lord. You fear the Lord. Eschew, you hate evil. You put it away from you. Amen. It's irritating to you. Seek peace. That's what the Bible says. Uh, eschew evil, do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. That's make it happen, basically. <laughs> so, seek peace. And for you to seek peace, the Bible says the wisdom that is from, a, from above is first of all pure. You find that in James chapter 3. It's first of all pure. So, you're not compromising purity. Don't compromise purity. Because if you actually want peace, you first get purity. So, Oh, I want America to live a peaceful life, or I want peace in America, then fight for purity of America first. Don't try to get the peace and forget about the purity. Fight for the purity first. Amen? Um, and this world is compromising uh, peace. Sorry, compromising with the Sodomites for peace. Oh, you know what? Let's just leave peace. See, if you want to marry a frog, that's, that's your business. Just marry a frog. I just want to live peaceably. You see that? Everyone is compromising. They don't care about purity anymore. These pedophiles are going for the children. You know, just, just let us live in peace. You know, I just want peace. That's not how you get peace. Purity first. All right. Uh, open to Second Chronicles chapter 16. All right. I'm back in verse 12 of our First Peter chapter 3. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Second Chronicles 16.9, the Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have words. So God is looking. He, his eyes are running to and fro. He's looking for those that are hard. Are, their hearts are perfect towards God. That means they put God first. They are serving God. They are not serving man or idols or anything. Uh, so, and if your heart is perfect towards Him, He's going to be strong on your behalf. He's going to fight from you, for you. He's going to pull you out of the fire. He's going to like be with you in the burning furnace. That's what God is going to do. He's going to be strong on your behalf. But if your heart is not for for, uh, for Him, He's watching you also, and His judgment is going to come upon you. So His eyes are up, his, uh, his eyes are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to your prayers. In Psalm 7, verse 11, Psalm 7, verse 11, that's open there. The Bible says, God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. There's no day that goes by that God is not angry with them, with the wicked. So, can you imagine how angry God is with the wicked in America? He's angry with the wicked every day. And I finally found that verse. I remember I lost it one time. But in Psalm chapter 12, it's talking about the wicked everywhere. Still don't remember it, but I know where it is now. <laughs> in Psalm chapter 12, verse 8, 
The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. When a vile man is exalted, his praise is raised up to be a president or to be a leader or a ruler. Guess what happens? The wicked is everywhere. The wicked is everywhere. So if you're one of them that are raising a vile man, then guess what? You're spreading the wicked everywhere. So is that man vile? Don't, don't raise him up. Don't raise him up. Don't exalt him. If he's not vile, then fine. But if you think he's vile and you exalt him, you are raising the wicked everywhere. And God is angry with the wicked every day. Look at verse 13. Let's move on. First Peter chapter 3. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? Romans, open to Romans 8.31. Romans 8.31. So Peter is telling them, who will harm you if you're following that which is good? Like, who has the audacity to touch the Lord's own, the apple of the Lord's eye? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Who is that person that will go there and touch you? <laughs> See, that's why God does, is there any evil in the city that the Lord had not done? Is God has allowed it because nobody has the audacity to do it in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 this is what Paul said what shall we say then to these things sorry what shall we then say to these things um, if God be for us who can be against us like who is the if God is for you who can be against you who is he that will harm you right that's the same thing verse 32 he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect it is God that justified who is he that condemneth it is Christ that died yea rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So understand this. Nothing that separate you from the love of God. Nobody can harm you without God allowing it to happen. So if something is happening to you, then just know that that's, what, that's God's will. And look at what it reads. Let's keep reading in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. So who is it that can harm you? But if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That means be ready to give, explain to them the gospel. Why are you so okay? Why are you okay with all these things happening to you? Because I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. And, my, and God says his, the grace of God is sufficient for me. That's what Paul, God told Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm happy, <laughs> right? David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I don't want to have, lose that joy. I want to have the joy of, of, of my salvation. So, be ready to give them an answer. When they are looking at you like, what's going on? Why are you still okay with the world going, literally going to hell? Why are you still okay? Because I'm saved. Amen? Verse 16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you your good conversation in Christ. So, when would that happen? During the day of visitation. We looked at that in chapter 2 already. So, be ready to answer every man. Why? Because they will wonder because of the peace that passeth all understanding. Now, the world is seeking their own worldly peace. You know, world peace and safety. That's, and the Bible says when they say peace and safety, then travel will come upon them or destruction will come upon them as a woman in travail. So, but we, we have our own peace because uh, the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is joy, peace, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So, in the Holy Ghost, righteousness, peace, and joy. So, we have our own peace and it's a peace that passes all understanding. Why? John 16, 33, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Alright, look at verse 17 there, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. 
For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing. For Christ also had suffered one, sorry, Christ also had well suffered for sins and just, sorry, did just for the unjust that he might that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by, all, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. All right, this is a very hard part of the scripture, but it's actually easy to understand if you, you know, you read what, you, you believe what you read and not come with uh, uh, false beliefs or believe what you uh, read what you believe so believe what you read so the Bible says if the will of God be so so God's will is not the same for all of us concerning suffering to some will be thrown into prison to some will be killed to some you know will have stripes Concerning your persecution, you don't use, oh, if you're thrown into prison versus if you have stripes, the one that's thrown into prison is godlier than the one that, you know, comparing yourselves among yourselves is not wise. That's what the Bible says. So don't, don't compare yourself with Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus died until, until that happens, until you suffer like he suffered, all of that. And so compare yourself with Christ and you always see that you don't match up. So, because looking unto Christ, the often finish of our faith. So don't compare yourselves among yourself because it's the will of God concerning our suffering Suffering is different. Remember, all evil is from the Lord. All the harm is God's will. It also depends on the times you're living in. What if you're living in prosperous times where people actually fear the Lord? Uh, you know, it depends on the times you're living in that will determine how much the persecution you get. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could go on the streets or people in schools were calling, you know, their classmates fags without being thrown out of school. Right? But make a mistake and even just look. In fact, call somebody that thinks he's a she a he. Like just, just call somebody his right pronoun, and you 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 have a fine in uh, United uh, say United States. In United States, in New York, you have a fine. You lose your rights, your license. I mean, just different things. Just because you said, "Hello, sir," uh, it's man. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> So not a talk of calling fact. You see, you get different persecutions depending on the times you're living in. And understand, the days are becoming evil. They're not becoming better. So be, be smart concerning that. Walk circumspectly, redeeming the time. Uh, so where was I? So Jesus preached unto the spirits in prison. What does this mean, right? What does it mean? In a popular explanation that people say, the wrong explanation, because it's popular, obviously, the wrong explanation is that when Jesus died, he went into hell and he released all those prisons, uh, spirits in prisons. You know, so who are those spirits in prisons? Those are the, the Old Testament saints. Old Testament believers that believed on the Lord. You know, he went to release Abraham. Abraham has been suffering there in prison, in hell. You know, this is what people believe that Jesus went into hell with his blazing sword. Right? The devil came and he was like, you know, he won. This is what they believe that Jesus went to hell and fought the devil. One took the keys from the devil's pocket. It's powerful, right? Conquered death. Yeah. I don't know if you guys ever believed that, but yeah. I actually did believe it one time growing up. But that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> I don't know what the Bible says. Over to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Doesn't make sense in many levels. Jesus was there to pay the price for our sins. Amen? All right. But let's take it one at a time. Now, if you are a dispensationalist, or a dispensationalist would try to dispensationalize this, the gospel, he would say, oh yeah, this is how those people in the Old Testament got saved. Dispensationalize is my word. Don't look for it in the dictionary. <laughs> I made it up. All right, so they'll try to dispensationalize it and say, yeah, this is how they were saved in the Old, in the Old Testament. No. Absent from the body, uh, absent from the body is present with the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Once they died, they went to heaven. Abraham's bosom, Abraham was in heaven, he was in paradise, right? And they looked down, uh, Lazarus, uh, to Lazarus. So, not to Lazarus, with Lazarus to the rich fool. Not rich fool, the rich man. Jeez, mixing all the power. <laughs> all right, Isaiah 61, verse 1. Time is going, so let's go fast here, because I have to break this down real quick. 
Verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord had anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now let's look at that reference in Luke chapter 4. When Jesus was starting his ministry here on earth, he quoted the same thing. He, in fact, he read the same thing. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, in verse 16, Luke 4, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth. This is where he grew up, Nazareth, right? Because his father took him, Joseph took him, and they didn't want to leave, they didn't want to leave uh, where they were before, and they moved to Nazareth, right? They didn't want to live in Bethlehem. <laughs> so that's why they didn't, they didn't know that Joseph was from Bethlehem. All right, they moved to Nazareth. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Oh, in fact, I didn't forget about that, but it just says that. Where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he had anointed me to preach the gospel. See, gospel means good tidings. You can just compare the both passages and you see uh, comparisons, I guess. The same, the same thing, but explaining it to us. That's why I get the gospel, good tidings means good news. The gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. How did he say it there? To proclaim liberty to the captives, to preach deliverance to the captives. And look at what it says. And recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So recovering of sight to the blind, the setting at liberty to them that are bruised, is the same as the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And I'm going to explain that further. Remember, he's reading directly from the Bible. This is not Jesus, you know, not that Jesus would quote the wrong thing, but albeit he's not just quoting on the fly, like using his own words. Say, so, okay, he was preaching, so he used different words. No, he's actually reading the scriptures. And this is what he says. And unless you're going to say, oh, yeah, there's a mistake in the KJV. And all, yeah. No, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's literally the same thing. You say, ah, is it the same thing? Maybe he stopped reading or he skipped. No, keep reading. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. After that, at the band, says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is back in Isaiah 61. All right, so just comparing them, you see the uh, prison, the opening of prison to them that are bound is recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Uh, let's keep reading, verse 20, Luke chapter 4. And he closed the book and he gave it, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, here's what he said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. So when did he go to prison and release them? Right? Setting them that are in prison. How do you say it again? An opening of the prison to them that are bound. When did he do that? This day. This day. It was fulfilled. This day. He didn't say, oh, it, it is soon come when I die. He so says, it's done now. So what does that mean? I'll take you back again to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, verse 5, Isaiah 42, verse 5, the Bible says, Thus said God, the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that, and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and will give thee a covenant for the people, for a light of the the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So this is the same thing God said that he will do. He will do to his people. To open the blind eyes. This is them overcoming prison. Jesus going into the prison and setting them free. 
It means setting them free from the bondage of sin. When your eyes are open, you're no, you're no more bound to sin because you can see the truth. You know the truth, the truth will set you free, right? And this is the bruises of sin because sin is a bad master. If you're a servant of sin, you will suffer. And when you're not saved, you're in bondage to sin. You cannot but sin. But when you're saved, God is saying, walk in the spirit. You don't have to fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, when you walk in the spirit, you will not sin because he that is born of God cannot sin. You see that? So in John, open to Romans 6, in John chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. This is what he was talking about. As he was preaching the gospel, he was setting them free. He said, It is fulfilled this day. Setting you free is opening your eyes. Uh, removing the, uh, you from the bondage of sin. And if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed from sin. So, free from bondage of sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. So when you, when you, ac when you accept the Lord, when you get saved, you're, you, you're, you're dead with him. And you say, oh, but Jesus has already died. See, I died before the foundation of the world, folks in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Because Jesus already died for the foundation of the world. All right. So how about the long suffering in the days of Noah? So Noah preached the gospel while he was on the ark. And God said, he's going to wait. For, he said, my spirit is not going to strive with the spirit of man forever, right? And God waited for, I think, about 100 years or so, because Noah was... I think it's about 100 years. I don't want to go back in because of time. So we'll go back and break it down. But we did Genesis. We just came from doing Genesis. So I still have it fresh in my head a little bit. So Noah waited for years while he was building the ark. And he was preaching to them. The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Right? So Noah was preaching to them. And God was giving them time. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing. He's trying to set people free while they are alive. It's not going to hell. See, how does that make sense? Why is he preaching to people in hell? There's no more hope for them. You're done. Once you're in hell, if not, the, the rich man would have gone to heaven. I mean, Jesus would just go and preach to him when he died. <laughs> but he was done. Who do you think in hell will refuse Jesus when he comes to preach? <laughs> I know, right? That means there'll be nobody in hell. After Jesus died, there's nobody else in hell. Because everybody will get saved. <laughs> so the preaching is the only way you're alive, folks. So if he says you preach to them, that means they're alive. They're not in hell. Once you go to hell, it's over. So, and that's what I was trying to explain with Noah. Then when they died, it was over. All right, let's finish up verse 21. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So, when he says, uh, the like figure went unto baptism, now doth save us. Because he's talking about, remember, Noah, baptism, they're all immersed in the water. Baptism means immersion, right? And when he's saying baptism, he's not saying that baptism saves, like what that being baptized is what saves you. You know, some people believe, oh, you have to baptize to be saved. No, you just have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house, right? So, uh, and that's why he made the Bible makes it very clear. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh when you talk about the baptism, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So, if you go through baptism, you say, yeah, I have a clear conscience. I've done what God said I should do. I'm, water baptism, you're symbolizing actual baptism because we are immersed in Christ. Christ suffered for our sins. He was immersed in hell. That's the baptism that Christ had. Yeah, because after he had water baptism, he said he's going to be baptized. <laughs> you know, so he was he suffered for our sins, and we too will die with him. See, we're immersed with him and will rise with him the newness of life, and we should live in that newness of life. So it is believing on Jesus that will save you from sin, right? Not what being immersed in water that will save you from sin. So that's what it makes that clear. All right. I think that's the end. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. 
uh, First Peter chapter 3, having the, a, a mind of Christ. I pray as a church, O oh Lord, that we have one mind, have one purpose, we grow in you. Uh, concerning our family, uh, we play our roles, a husband and a wife. I pray, O oh Lord, that you keep the cells of the church, because the cells of the church is the family. You keep the cells of the church alive and booming so that the church, the body of Christ, will be able to uh, have one mind and work for you. I pray, O oh Lord, that you help us to understand this even more and more. And these difficult passages, let us go home, let us study it, let us understand it, grasp it, so that we can understand more of what you require of us and what you have done for us, so, to know you and the power of your resurrection. Help us, O oh Lord, in, in that aspect, in Jesus' name. As we go, go with us, bless us. Next time we meet, O oh Lord, let it be to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.